here at Habitat by Honours Beep, I have with me over 20 parents and children who are here to talk about the education system. But there's also a mystery guest coming in later on. Like the PSLE is all hyped up. Why kids have to cry over studies? Isn't it so unfair to them? The parents and children don't know it, but Education Minister Ong Yi Ka will be secretly listening into their conversation. This is a special one-hour edition of Talking Point. Hello and welcome to the show. Welcome to all of you. As we know, school is going to be really different. In fact, it is very different for our kids today compared to when we were in school. In fact, from this year, key exams will be removed at certain levels. That means no more exams for P1 and P2. Do I see some happy faces? No more mid-year exams for secondary one. And in two years' time, no more mid-year exams for primary three, primary five, and secondary three. Now, imagine that. I expected to see some smiles on your faces, but uh, you're a tough crowd. Looks like I have to convince you. So does no exams mean less stress? And is everyone happy with the new system? So to get things going, earlier we did a bit of a poll. We asked you if less exams equate less stress. Let's take a look at the results. See what you all voted. Oh, such a close fight. 54% say yes, it means less stress. That's the separation of the vote, just by one person. So we've got a very equal crowd here today. So many of you don't believe that less exams will equal less stress. Why is that the case? Well, um, I think it depends on how you, how you see it. Um, at the year end, for example, there will still be exams. At P3, we're still working towards the same end point. Yeah, so if you haven't been revising regularly, right. etc., then you might feel that, you know, you still have to face it at the end of the day. So, so it's almost like it might be a surprise when it comes on because you're not <laughs> used to the idea of taking exams. Yeah, or maybe there is a, just a steeper curve, you know, when, when you do hit it. So, so should we continue having exams? Maybe even have more of them so the kids get used to it? Well, <laughs> maybe you should ask the kids. Yeah, well, let me ask your daughter, Vera. What do you think, Vera? Yeah... It helps me to know which subject I need to work on more to improve. Well, the discussion seems to have taken off, but what the audience don't know is that we have a special guest listening into their conversation, and he's none other than the education minister himself. We shouldn't be having exams for the sake of having exams, for the sake of giving our students a mark, you know, or mm -hmm. a, a grade that will determine their self-worth. Um, I feel that the exams sh should be holistic, such that um, the child doesn't feel that they are being access, assessed um, um, just by that number. And if they don't do well, um, that means that they are not good enough. But, but you still feel that the exams are useful? Um, yes, if you don't have exams, um, you need some other way to teach children discipline right. and resilience that if you don't do well, how am I going to do better the next time? Okay. So you still need some way to um, tell them where they are and what they should do about it. Okay, so mm. exams to help keep the kids disciplined. So I think um, when your question asks, does no exams equal less stress? I think if exams are not packed to a performance, to the advancement to the next level, then I think the kids will take the exams because they want to know how much do they know about a particular topic and they will not be stressed about it. I think the stress comes from the number that they need to achieve in order to advance, in order to level up. I right. think that's what gives them the stress. But the exam in itself, you feel, is a useful tool. Yeah. I feel exams are important because it's a checkpoint. It's how the exams are being presented. Because it's all hyped up. Like the PSLE is all hyped up. Even before, before that, the prelims, all the P6s will all sit in a hall, different from all the other levels. When they are P1 all the way to P5, they don't do this. They don't do the exams in a hall. But they hype it up, and everybody is worried. And they oh, did you bring your entry, point, uh, entry tickets and everything? So the whole presentation is different. I think it's the term that we use as well. If we use the word test, the little kids are going through little tests and assessments. The kids are able to take it. And in fact, the parents, when they hear the word test, they are not so pressured. But the moment you change the word uh, test to an exam, 
somehow, you know, it's always hype up for so many years in Singapore. You hear the word exam, it becomes uh, a major decision point that if the child is unable to meet a certain uh, performance indicator, maybe set by the school, set by the parents, the child is able to see the expectations reflected. Okay. Yeah, and they made themselves feel it. So the exam itself is not a bad thing, but the environment that we kind of package the exam in. I'm going to come to you, Khaled. You said, <laughs> thank goodness exams are finally gone, right? The way I see it, um, well, in real life situation, you don't exactly have exams, you know, so I think that exams should be for things where you need to put, uh, let's say, uh, test a certain stress level, you know, but in terms of learning, it has to be a progressive um, effort. So which means to say that taking away the exam is one aspect of it, but what do you do about it? You know, if you, um, because kids, just like us, as we grow up, uh, we, we learn. And how do we learn? Is it, is it just because we sit for exams or do we learn from experiences and making mistakes and all that? So that in itself should be the focus of the learning. The exam should be in a way, uh, if you want to uh, maybe uh, groom a person to handle certain level of stress, and therefore the exam should come in to facilitate just that portion only. Jia Hui, are you, are you concerned about how our kids are being assessed today? Um, I feel exams are necessary because it's a measurement of how well the kids um, have studied, have learned. However, um, having totally no exams, the system has to be such where the infrastructure is set up, ready to, ready to support a no exam system. So during the entire year, there should be systems set up where you have maybe projects, maybe classroom participation, maybe journal writing, and all these would add up to the final checkpoint so that the year-end exams will not be with such heavy weightage. With that heavy weightage, um, this stress thing is always there. Always. What do you think, Ben? Okay, just to share with all the parents here, this afternoon before I came here, my son, he shared with me, he said one of her, uh, his friend just cried in the class today. I said, what happened? He said, because she thinks she done badly for her exam. Then I'm like, I think back, why, why kids have to cry over studies? Isn't it so unfair to them? Because to me, I think life is many more stress ahead. So I think for the kids, they should have, be, they should have fun, right? School should be a place to release stress, to have fun, to make friends, to learn something, rather than just go there and like, oh, I'm so stressed about, exam is coming, I must do good grades. I have to go and check around all my, my classmates, how well they do, how, uh, what, how many points they get. All this stress actually is not from them. Actually, it's all from parents and, of course, the teachers and schools. Uh, like, especially for parents, I think um, I, I do met some of the kids, like my, 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 uh, my boys' classmate. Keep checking around when come to exam, when they get the result, they will go around and ask, hey, how many points you get? How many points you get? I'm thinking like, this is not so healthy. Okay, because there's yeah. so much comparison and there's so much, uh, in fact, so much peer pressure. Would you, would you, Kiana, would you be happy if there were less exams at school? Do you think that would make you less stressed? If there's more exams, it's like easier to like balance out if you do very average for okay. one so, exam. So you actually and, like, wouldn't mind having more exams? Yeah. Well, the best discussion would be useless if we didn't have the right people here. Take a look over there. We've got special guests. Hello. <laughs> Hi, Hello. everyone. Can I ask you, do you know who he is? He's the Minister of Min uh, in the Ministry of Education. Oh, very good. Good job. What's my name? Good job. Your name is Mr. Kang. Mr. Kang. Oh, wow. Close it now. <laughs> well done. <laughs> okay, okay. Good job, good job. Even we tell ourselves, let's not be so stressed, you find that you can't help it. Like it or not, this is how we sieved out the, the leaders from the followers. We asked parents if they would cut back on tuition for their kids now that there are less exams. Let's bring up the results. Welcome back to this special edition of Talking Point, where we're looking at changes in the education system and asking if uh, we want to move away from an exams-based approach and if that is the way to lessen the stress load on our kids. The moment you change the word uh, test to an exam, somehow, you know, it's always hype up. 
I, I do met some of the kids, like my, 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 uh, my boy's classmate. When they get the result, they will go around and ask, hey, how many points you get? How many points you get? If there's more exams, it's like easier to like balance out if you do very average for one exam. Well, we heard from the parents and children earlier on, but unknown to them, Education Minister Ong Yi Kang was listening in. Mr Ong, earlier on when the poll results came out, uh, fewer exams equals less mm. stress. Even though only one vote uh, was in favour of less stress, you said that it was better than you had expected. Why? It's cross 50%. If it's under 50%, Your then Your standard I, is this lower. Yeah, then I have a lot of explanation to do. <laughs> okay, right? we'll go right ahead. So I'm quite relaxed about the answer because the purpose of that policy is not to reduce stress. I know it has the effect of reducing stress, but that wasn't the purpose of that policy. What's the purpose of the policy? The purpose is that we have so many exams. If you take six years, go mid-year and year-end, that's 12 already plus... CAs, uh, uh, assessments, and you add, you can have 24, 36 weighted assessments in six years. I think we can do with a bit less. Actually, all exam does is to test your academic ability, right? It doesn't define who you are, right? Just one aspect of an education system. And other parents make the point that exam inculcate discipline, I think from somewhere here, which I think absolutely correct. Because in life now, we do a lot of things, it is hyped up, it is stressful, and we have to be prepared for that. And in a school environment, that's the best time to practice, no? because you can make mistakes, and then the consequences are not high. So uh, exams have its use, and I think it's not something we want to totally gotten, get rid of. So in fact, what we are doing is just to reduce it by 25%, because it has many other useful purposes. Well, well, Minister, I'm going to jump in. Exams, doesn't that contribute to quite a large percentage it, it of the stress? It does, but it's a secondary objective. So while you reduce 25%, that is a secondary objective of reducing stress. But what's the primary objective? I'm coming to that. Which is, for every exam we remove, we have three weeks of freed up curriculum time, which is very useful for teachers to then teach better and for students to learn better. Otherwise, it's like in Chinese, we say gan huo che, it's like chasing for the train. The teachers to rush for exam have to teach so fast and, and rush through the curriculum in order to prepare you for the exam. And it's over, I rush the second semester. So with this, teachers have a lot more time to teach properly and also to enact what we call enact a class in a much more interesting way. It may take you out to the garden, to the field, where you learn something by doing, learn something by experiencing. And that way you absorb the lessons much better. That's what we call by inquiry-based learning. Jen, do you believe that freeing up more time for curriculum and teaching, as the minister has said, will actually lead to less hectic schedule for the teachers in class? I hope, really, um, because teachers nowadays take up more administrative work as well, besides teaching. So, in fact, the love for teaching has diminished because the load of administrative work has increased. So, with that removing of or, or lesson of examination, we do hope, really, we do hope we give teachers more time to teach. I hope it's not, be, it's not because that they have more time now, therefore the school load them with more administrative work. What about the kids? What do you all think? Uh, do you find that for those of you who, has, who have had fewer exams, do you find that the teaching has changed? No, same, same. There's also a huge number that said that fewer exams does not equal to less stress. I want to hear from this group. You are nodding. So along the way, there will always be checkpoints. There will always be checkpoints that will lead up to the exams. So it doesn't help to bring it down. Our society itself is meritocratic. Like it or not, this is how we sieved out the, the, the leaders from the followers. It is like that. You like it or not, either in the tuition centre or in school or self-imposed at home. So there will always be stress. Well, so the question is, you know, so is it actually exam that is the cause of stress? So you have, you know, midterm, end term, um, CAs, essays, whatever it is. Is that the cause of stress or is the system as a whole ah. uh, that is the cause of stress? Now we got the bad guy, the system, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, just hang on a second. System who, means me. Who do you think, who do you think, uh, what is responsible for the stress? I think the stress is not, actually not really the, 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 the school. 
I think actually most of the stress is coming from the parents uh, who want the kid. Because of, like what she said, because of the meritoc meritocratic system, uh, the challenge to put the son right up there or the child right up there into a, you know, a premium school as opposed to a non-premium school, uh, uh, with all due respect, uh, um, allows, creates that stress. So I think the stress is more homebound, less schoolbound, to be honest with you. Who thinks that the stress is contributed by the parents? <laughs> Who thinks that the stress is contributed by the children themselves? The kids also can vote. Okay, not as many okay. as before. Who thinks that the stress is contributed by the system? Jang, jang, jang. Okay, Actually, kids. By, by, by system, by system, we mean we mean by system we mean um, the education minister. <laughs> uh, no, no, I'm just kidding. By system, we mean the overall people who are within the education ministry. Your teachers, good and bad. Right? The people who work within education, they work very hard, mind you. That is the system, okay? Who thinks that it's the system? Okay, go for it. All right, Khaled. I think the, the, the stress is multifaceted. Yes, it may come, it may originate from parents because parents always want their kids to do better than, you know, um, themselves, for example. But then again, then because of that, then the school will have to keep up. You know, parents will bang table at teachers and teachers will get stressed and after that. And for kids, they themselves have a certain benchmark they set for themselves. So it becomes a whole big animal altogether. So I think the issue here is actually it's a mindset issue. It's not just so much about whether we point finger to parents or teachers or education system or students. It is actually the entire mindset. It's a societal mindset. It and is we are all mindset. inside. Yes, correct. Minister, all I'm going to ask you to vote as well. System, parents... Kids, all of the above. <laughs> all of us are in it together. Even we tell ourselves, let's not be so stressed. You find that you can't help it. After a while, you're on the treadmill running, right? The kids too will tell themselves that. In a way, I you're saying every, everything contributes, right? I mean, and in a way, we continue perpetuated by having things like tuition. Earlier, we did another poll where we asked parents if they would cut back on tuition for their kids now that there are less exams. No, no, 43%, yes, 57%. Yes, cross 50. Wow. <laughs> wow, I am surprised. Okay, hang on, hang on. And then we asked the kids if they would prefer to have less tuition. Yes. Oh, you guys are normal kids. <laughs> Minister, is this the intended effect of the policy? Yes, I would say it's one of the intended effects. And question now is how do we start making some changes to break out of it? And my perspective is being MOE, being the government, we have to send the signal. And therefore, we send the signal and at least we cross 50. I'm not sure we can cross 50 three years ago when, if we do this poll. So I, I'm hoping, quietly hoping that we are getting somewhere, we are generating some momentum. We have parents speaking up. You know, and parents saying that maybe it's not just the school, it's also the students, also parents. I think three years ago, everyone would say it's the MOE minister. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but now I think the society is more mindful of what we are doing to ourselves. You have two girls. Did they have tuition? I never put them through tuition until they asked for it. So one of them asked for math because her math was, a, was struggling. At what age did they start asking for tuition? Oh, Primary school, I think. So we put her through some math tuition. We had we knew a tutor. A few months later, she said, "Papa, mommy, I don't need any more." And then we took her out. Did your girl share with you what was the reason that she felt she needed tuition? She couldn't keep up. Couldn't keep up. So the lessons uh, were taught. Couldn't keep up. Come home, can't do the homework. And at some point in time, she asked for it. Yeah. So, so minister, isn't that an indication that she was feeling the stress from others around her that she could not? keep up well if the question is are you feeling stress from others i think absolutely mm -hmm. because the fact is most of our stress is not self-generated you know stress you know most of us feel stress because of external uh, pressure and always it's about okay. comparing people 
Yeah, I'm really glad that at the ministry level, we're starting to do something about this because like what you mentioned, I think the stress is not just coming from us parents or from the students themselves, the pupils themselves. I think it's coming from the entire system, from society, from everywhere. And there are parents, parents like me, who do not believe in tuition. I know, right? Rare. Okay, there are parents like me as well who feel that we'd rather send our, uh, our children to neighborhood schools that are near our home. So it's a lot easier for them to get to school and come back and do their homework. But when we go out and we meet with other parents, we get the same reaction. What? Your kids have no tuition? What? They don't go to a good school or an elite school, even though we personally believe that every school is a good school here in Singapore. So that the kind of pressure like you said stress is not generated by us stress is generated by the competition the competitiveness of society of the people around us and not just ourselves at the end of the day exams are singapore can we live in an environment where employers no longer use resumes as the way to hire but use other methods look at this this is a job application form asking me for the subjects i took the grades i got for those subjects how many of you think this is from the private sector Welcome back to this special edition of Talking Point. So during the break, uh, the topic of parents' WhatsApp chat group came up very spontaneously. So we decided to do a quick poll of how many of the parents here are actually in a WhatsApp chat group. Here are the results. Oh, only 60%. I have to say, what's the response to that? Does that surprise you? Yes, I thought everyone would be in some kind of WhatsApp. <laughs> mm. Me too. <laughs> Are you in a WhatsApp chat group? No, nope, no. Nope. Oh, my time, no yeah. WhatsApp yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so we know the WhatsApp chat group can be very stressful, right? We've all gotten those who, you know, like at 10 o'clock at night, they say, tomorrow there's a mock exam or some Chinese test, and you're like, <gasps> how come I didn't know about it, right? So, okay, who said they're not in the chat group? Ben, let me get you first. Why, why, why haven't you joined the group? I wish my era is... Uh, <laughs> because I totally uh, disagree about the uh, WhatsApp group chat. Because I think it's not healthy. Because um, m I experienced myself that the group chat inside is like talking not about uh, education. It's about something else. Like maybe about your kid, about this teacher. And this is all not so healthy. I mm. think it should stop. It's a lot of comparison. Yeah? Exactly. Of comparison. It's like a keyboard warrior. Can, can okay. I just go to the minister? Mm. Uh, what is your position? What do you think about WhatsApp chat groups? Do they contribute to stress? Well, WhatsApp is just an app. It is innocent. Yeah, but <laughs> it's really up to the users, right? If the users use it for a good purpose, like reminding you tomorrow have a test, it's not a bad use of WhatsApp, actually. But if it becomes a forum for comparing, that my kid or taekwondo, how come yours don't have? I'm waking up at 5.30 to study, how come you're not? Then that's where we talk about stress. And because stress is always generated externally. Then we really have to review and reevaluate. Do you still want to be in that WhatsApp group? Or is it better that you gather a few parents that is more like-minded as you? And then you form your own WhatsApp group. Minister, and you can, can really compare things about education. If you had WhatsApp chat group now and the kids were younger, would you join? No. I'm very clear, I will not. But Diana, let me ask you, because I know you're in a chat group and you were saying you would never leave it. No, actually, I said that I was canvassing for opinion to see why I should leave it. Now that you heard our views, Ben's views, my views, will you exit it? Will I leave it? I had never actually thought of it that way before, but it's good that you put that in my head so that I will navigate very, very carefully. I'm a parent of a pair of twins. They are in primary one. And you know that students, uh, children in primary one, they are quite blur about what's happening in school. I'm actually in one of these chat groups. So one is like the parents, the primary one parents are like, like okay, what, where is the spelling list? My kid has just lost his spelling list and spelling is tomorrow. Can someone send me the picture? And it becomes a helpline for parents to ease the transition of students from kindergarten to primary one. Like, um, they will ask, uh, did someone take my child's pencil box home? Yeah. You know, and things like that. Yep, I totally yeah. take your point. In the interest of time, we need to move on to the next question. Do you think that the changes to the education system are merely cosmetic? At the end of the day, Singapore 
values exams because that's how we measure all of us. When you meet your neighbour's kids and you find out that this kid is 12 at P6, the next question is, are you stressed about PSLE? If he's 16, you ask about O-levels. So these are mindsets that the whole society has. So taking away mini exams doesn't help because at the end of the day, exams are Singapore. How is, we get is that fair, Minister? Right. At the end, Singapore is exams. That's how we are measured by that score. What's your response mm -hmm. to that? Um, it's a fairly fair comment because we value meritocracy so much. Meritocracy means you have to allocate places, jobs, promotions by performance. And for children, what's the best way to gauge performance is really through exams. And so, but it has worked well for us uh, such that students are encouraged to work hard Parents place a lot of emphasis on education and generally our people are very well prepared yeah, for, for life and to lead a fulfilling life to contribute to society. But I think we have reached a stage where we might be overdoing it yeah, and I think it's time to unwind it without losing the fundamental principle of meritocracy. Uh, I just want to add one point to add to what you say. Uh, I suspect Talking to so many parents, it's not the exam and the score of exam that is important, but the milestone exams. That means leading up, finally, PSLE, and why is it so stressful and important? Because it then decides on secondary school. And after secondary school, your O or N level, then decide on your post-secondary school. And then university or poly, then decide on your job. So we have all these gateways that decide what the next stage of our life is. And that is quite important for us to think about. What I'm hearing is the PSLE itself, the score itself, isn't the stress. The stress is secondary one allocation. What school are you going to end up in? Mm. And yet MOE has decided not to touch sec one allocation this time round. Why is that so? Mm. Actually, we did. Some time ago, when we released the PSLE scoring system, we have a round of such discussion. And people say, just changing the PSLE is not going to make a huge difference. But today we've been discussing cutting of exam, and I think I'm hearing the same thing, just cutting exams is not going to change the system fundamentally. I totally agree. But if we put all this together, plus the changes that we're making in secondary school, removing and phasing out streaming over time, introducing alternate modes of entry to secondary school and beyond that is based on individual talents that we can spot in a child, including raw talent. That means I don't boil you down to one number. I try my best to judge and evaluate the talent of this child and give admission places to the child at secondary school level through DSA, as well as in poly, IT, university. I think put it all together, we are trying our best to make a sea change in the system. We're going to do one more poll. How many of you here feel that it doesn't really change anything? Will the reforms make any difference? I'll give you 10 seconds to put your answers in. Yes or no, will the reforms make any kind of impact? Well, I, I hope I go beyond 50. It's like sitting for exam, really. So we ask you, will the reforms make any kind of impact? Let's see the results. 13% say no, 87% say yes. Wow, wow, they clap for you, Mr. Ong. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> that was a good You give me a lot of encouragement. Okay, Minister, not everyone is convinced yet. Yeah, I feel that a change has to happen not just on the surface. It has to go even deeper beyond that. So which means to say, right, while, while the education system is doing something about it, but I think as a whole, everybody needs to look at it and, and, and see how they can also play a part. You know, if you were to say that, okay, we remove the exams, but then the school itself, uh, for example, they themselves are having, they're struggling their own ways to try and see how they can, they can prepare their students better for the bigger exam. Then... It, you know, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't come back to... It, what it does is actually it just push a problem down the streamline. I think what he's saying, in fact, is the whole scheme of the, the whole ecosystem. So we're talking about right down to employers. I raise that because we went and looked up some job application forms and I was pretty surprised to see this. Look at this. This is a job application form asking me for the subjects I took, the grades I got for those subjects. Uh, you are applying for a job. I, well, you never know, right? You never know. But I was so so shocked to see that. And I mean, how many how many of you think this is from the private sector? Who who thinks it's from the private sector? I think it's. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, they are all correct. Let's take a look where this job application from form rather is from. 
Did you, did you have you to apply think... for that, Minister, when you... Uh, <laughs> you <can't... laughs> I did, including my PSLE scores. Yeah. So do you think, Minister, that the government should walk the talk by maybe taking the lead and eliminating such practices? Yes. 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 And when <laughs> and how will they do that? No, it's, it's like raking a, a garden that has really overgrown. Every time I spot any ministry, any private sector company that still hire based on minimum B3 in math, minimum 5 O-level, I will always tell them, can you remove that? Why do you want that? They say that's because I need my employees to have some level of literacy, some level of numeracy. I say I have the test for you. But Why Minister, not? this form is from the civil service. Yeah. Why not start there? I'm not in charge of that. <laughs> but I will definitely bring it back. Having said that, I think it's reasonable to ask for qualifications. Or if you're an honest student, ask whether you're okay. a whatever class, but to ask for every grade, unless this is a specific job where you really need a particular subject, uh, knowledge. Then you specify. Like a doctor needs biology, you figure. Right? A doctor needs a doctor license. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're going to ask Martin about this. Do you still see forms like that or companies asking for grades? I, I would say majority of time, people still ask for resumes. And by using resumes, they were actually looking for qualifications. In, and as employees, if I have 100 resumes, what do I do? I have two places. I will sort out and I'll filter based on education. Degree, non-degree. Non-degree, I throw out. Degree, which university you come from. But the problem is that that's no longer a good proxy. I think, Minister, you have said, every talent is different. Employers are looking for talent that suits their company, more than just the qualification that actually justify. Can we live in an environment where employers no longer use resumes as the way to hire, but use other methods like psychometric assessments and Go so on? Go ahead, please, Mr. So I'm trying to give a fair view and fair and balanced view. I think education qualifications is not irrelevant to an employer, especially if you're hiring a fresh grad and there's no work experience to talk about, no track record. So that is relevant, but it cannot be the only yardstick, right? Uh, increasingly, you have to decide what kind of skills, what kind of competencies, what kind of character suits my company, and you must have more sophisticated technique to sieve out such people. Do you worry that there may be a perception that your children who are higher ability, uh, who may eventually become the leaders of society, don't need to mix with other people? I think social mixing will not come about automatically just because you put uh, different sort of streams of students in one room. Welcome back. We've been discussing changes to the Singapore education system. So do you think, Minister, that the government should walk the talk by maybe taking the lead and eliminating such practices? Yes. Yes. The change has to happen not just on the surface. It has to go even deeper beyond that. Education qualifications is not irrelevant to an employer, but it cannot be the only yardstick. And one of the major changes that's coming up is moving away from streaming to subject-based banding, which is SBB. Now, the intention is that it will bring about more social mixing amongst our students and to encourage them to help one another. We've done a poll on whether social mixing will, uh, or rather, earlier on we did a poll on whether subject-based banding will in fact result in greater social mixing. Let's take a look at the results. <gasps> oh, 50. 50. That's amazing. Um, I think social mixing will not come about automatically just because you put uh, different sort of streams of students in one room. You know, because, you know, you could have, like, even that, you could have a situation where they are more, even more split, you know, because there is nobody to facilitate the understanding, the inclusion. So I think um, the teachers really have to play a central role. Um, in helping the students uh, and setting the culture and the tone. Right. So many parents are concerned about the type of kids they mix with. Are you concerned about the, perhaps the negative influences that might come from other kids? I would actually be glad that she'll be in a position to maybe help or be a role model. Guna, can we hear from you? What are your thoughts? I think putting mixed ability 
putting different students in, 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 in subject-based bands is, is great because exactly to the point she said, uh, um, there will be roles for people to, to lead and there will be roles for people to learn and excel. Can I get your reaction with a very specific question? Yes. And that is, the subject-based bending will be implemented in schools that have the three streams, the two normal as well as the express. Yeah. Now, the so-called higher uh, ability children in SEP schools as well as IP will not be affected. Why? Well, partly it's such an integral feature of the system already. So we're trying to make a balance here to have diversity between schools so some school is IP stream, some schools are uh, also IB stream. And for IP and I IB, if you are a school catering to that kind of pathway, you do need that academic rigor. If you start bringing in other students who are not ready, I think they're just going to suffer, right? Uh, On the other true? hand, you also have Spectra and Crest that offer much more technical uh, education, right? And also for then you need to have, then you have a whole school approach to teach students in those areas, to be technically a lot more adept. And therefore, you also want to channel students with those aptitudes into those schools. So you want to have diversity between schools, different kinds of schools, but within the middle 80% of schools, you want diversity within the schools. Do you worry that there may be a perception that your children who are higher ability, uh, who may eventually become the leaders of society, don't need to mix with other people? Then the school has a responsibility that beyond just educating the kids and making them excel academically, make sure we participate in VIA, in Values in Action, participate in community immersion, get out of the school, go for adventure learning with other schools, find different platforms to, so that you can mix with students from, from the neighbourhood. So the schools are solely responsible for that and they have autonomy over that? Not just autonomy, I think uh, the Ministry HQ would like them to do that. So Alyssa, do, do you believe that in such environments there might be an increased risk of bullying? I did have uh, one educator, I mean, sharing an incident with me that uh, she was in this school which I will not share any name, and it's, uh, it's quite, they were considered a really, really good school. And one child actually went up to the other child and told them, if, uh, if you know, I am in your position right now, my parents would be very unhappy with me. So this particular child who told uh, the other child happens to be considered from one of the top classes. And the other child who she spoke to was considered from a class that uh, they were considered one of the, you know, not so, elite, uh, not so high ability. So there's definitely a bell curve somewhere. Melina, over here. Yep, your child is in the normal stream. What do you think of SBB? I think it's good, because eventually when they go to the work, the workforce, they will definitely have to meet with, with everybody with different characteristic. You know, I have a real life example, Ben. You were saying that you shared with me that you right. did not go to a very good school. Right, right. Do you think you are better off for it? In fact, my class is like one of the, the worst class. And it's every recess time or after school, there's like wrestling all around. Like students <laughs> pick up on the other students. <laughs> and, but I find it's interesting. You learn to protect yourself. You learn, this is all life experience, which you don't learn from books. Okay, uh, I just want to say I'm a product of the SBB. During my time in school, we had SBB oh. from P5, for math, for Chinese, and for English. So every time there's math, the whole cohort, we just move. And mm -hmm. for English, we move. And for Chinese, we move. Mm -hmm. So I was in the very worst Chinese class. So did, did it work for you? Did you find it was helpful? Um, Results-wise, we graduated together from the worst to the next worst. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Because we are, we are all the same. We are all so bad. We, we spoke English. The teacher had to speak English to explain the Chinese phrase. So, so we are all same standard. near. So, so in a way, you brought each other down in a way. And you, <laughs> okay, you that's not my point. My yeah, point no. <laughs> I, I, I got to mix with lots of other people right. in the same cohort. So that social mixing was very real. And when it's math, then we, we mixed again. So okay. that, it was really good fun. That is exactly the impact we are trying to achieve. That you move from class to class and you are not in the same class because you belong to a certain stream 
for certain course and I can only study at a lower or less difficult level. Because if we do that, that has its use in the past, but I think we have reached a stage where it maybe overran its usage because a child in that environment after a while will feel labelled and stigmatised. Uh, so we talk about SBB, but the great experiment that is coming up, and we got 28 schools who is going to pilot this next year, which is to reform their classes, where their form classes are totally restructured, no longer based on results, no longer based on who is expressed, normal cat or normal tech, but restructure it in a way that mixes everybody. But when it comes to math, science, English, you split to different classes where people or students of similar standards get to study together. But PE, CCE, VIA, art, music, you know, they get to study together and encourage social mixing. Mm -hmm. So we have two schools called Edgefield Secondary, Bunde Secondary, that has already done this since two years ago. It has produced fantastic results. So we are very encouraged. Next year, 28 more schools will do, it, do this. By 2024, all schools will do it. Mr. Minister, can you elaborate on the results that you have achieved? What, what sorts of results have been encouraging for you? In the case of Boon Le, students that used to come late for school or even don't come to school, they are now looking forward to come to school. Why? Because they organise the, the classes by CCA. Yeah, by CCA, which is a vertical, vertical uh, organization of classes. So the students, Sec 1, Sec 2, they come to school, they look forward to come to school because I get to meet my seniors in the morning because before assembly, the form classes get together, which is all same CCA. And CCA is where they have a lot of bonding, a lot of friendship. And they're all looking forward and they're coming early for assembly. And, and this are. year, they look at their results, the results are also better. What is the weakest area that you need to work on? The weakest area is we, we have not tried. We just need to have some schools to be brave enough, try this first, learn from each other, and with the lessons, we can make it into a national system. We are running out of time, so I'm going to invite Mr. Ong to share with us your final thought. I have a question for all the parents here, which is years from now when all the children here are grown up and are adults and we are old enough to withdraw our CPF. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to ask you, when you reflect back on this phase of parenting, what would define our success as parents? I hope that, I mean, other than uh, achieving academic success, I want my children to go, grow up with good character, um, learning empathy, learning how to help people around them. To me, very simple. I just hope that he can come and tell me like I had a wonderful childhood. How I gauge would be, um, would they be living their dreams or are they living our dreams? Um, I hope that my children can turn around, look at me and tell me, Mummy, we were trailblazers and we did things differently. Thank you. Can I just say something yes, to please. end? So, as we ponder about PSLE exams, the next test, I hope parents out there will all remember these answers. Because that's what that matters. Well, it has been a fabulous discussion with the parents as well as the minister. We certainly hope that this is not the end of the discussion for you. We have given you ideas to start thinking more about the changes to education. This has been a special edition of Talking right. Point. We want to thank all of you for coming out, taking the time, bringing your kids and minister for coming here, breathing thank you. the storm. <laughs> and thank you for joining us on this special edition of Talking Point. Bye, everyone.